Welcome back to our study of the fundamentals of operating systems. This series of lectures is based on the book Operating System Concepts, 10th edition, by Silbershots, Galvin, and Gagne, and published by Wiley Publishing. In the last lesson, we started our discussion of mass storage systems, the device manager or the mass storage manager of the operating system. We're going to continue on that series of lessons, but before we do, I would like to bring that graphic of the hard drive back up and do a little impromptu tour. I know we covered the material pretty much in depth, but at the same time, I believe if I can just chat with you about it a little bit and point its various images on the graphic, that it might help clarify things for you. So we'll begin with that. Now here is the inner workings of a typical magnetic disk drive, hard disk. And it's called a hard disk because these platters that you see right here are made out of a metallic material. Now, it is a magnetic medium just like a magnetic tape. The technology is exactly the same. It's just that the platter itself is a, is a metal platter. And the way the data is stored is by means of a coating of magnetic oxide that covers both sides of this platter. Now if you look over to the side here, you see the read-write heads. And you'll notice that there is a head just above and just below each platter. You'll also notice that the heads are mounted on arms. And the that allows them to move in and out of the disk. Now what you're not seeing here are the concentric rings on this disk that are called tracks on which data is stored. And there would be a, a they would be similar to a regular track at the gym. Instead of being oval though, it would be round and each lane would represent a track. The difference here is that there would be a whole lot more lanes, or tracks in this case, than there would be at that gym. But in any case, these are concentric rings. It's not one long spiraling track going around and around and around. It is individual separate concentric rings. Now actually a CD drive does use a spiraling single long continuous track like that. You'll notice that each head is sitting over the same track on each disk. And that is called a cylinder. And when data is written, it is actually written to the cylinder. As the heads are moving back and forth, it is each one of them is writing data to the tracks as they go. Now this disk that you see here, in this case we have three of them, these things are spinning. You recall in that lecture that we found that they were spinning as up to 15,000 RPMs. That's, that is very fast. And that's the reason that hard disk drives are so fast when compared to tape and magnetic uh, floppy disks. Because they're in a vacuum environment and that disk can really spin. Let's say we had a piece of data right over here. Rotational delay is the time it takes for that data to come around here to the head where it can be written. And seek time is the time it takes for this arm to bring the head over the track to the location of that data. So access time, or position in time, access time is the term we'll usually hear, is the combination of rotational delay and seek time. Now this arm, this assembly here, holding these arms, is moving back and forth from in to out and back again. And the discs are spinning at up to, in a typical floppy disk drive, you probably have a 7200 RPM disk. But that's still moving right along, don't you think? So is it any wonder that that mechanical hard drive is not nearly as reliable as this non-volatile memory device that you'll find enclosed in a case very much like that of a mechanical hard drive? 
Well, I think that covers what I wanted to in this little impromptu tour. So let's pick up where we left off and conclude this section or this unit on mass storage systems. A secondary storage device is attached to a computer by a system bus or an input output bus. Several kinds of buses are available including advanced technology attachment ATA, serial advanced technology attachment SATA, eSATA, SCSI, serial attached SCSI, SAS, universal serial bus, USB, and fiber channel. The most common connection method is SATA because non-volatile memory devices are much faster than hard drives, the industry created a special fast interface for non-volatile devices called NVM Express. NVM Express directly connects the device to the system PCI bus, increasing the throughput and decreasing latency compared with other connection methods. The data transfers on a bus are carried out by special electronic processors called controllers. The host controller is the controller at the computer end of the bus. A device controller is built into each storage device. So you have a host controller that's interfacing to the bus, and then you have a device controller that's interfacing to the storage device. To perform a mass storage input-output operation, the computer places the command into the host controller, typically using memory mapped input-output ports. The host controller then sends the command via messages to the device controller. The device controller operates the device hardware to carry out the command. Device controllers usually have a built-in cache of their own. Data transfer at the drive happens between the cache and the storage media, and the data transfer to the host occurs between the cache host dynamic RAM via direct memory access. You recall in the last lesson our discussion of direct memory access. This, the operating system has allowed these controllers to directly manage memory. In other words, it's subjugated that area of memory to the device controller releasing control on its own. It regains control when the device controller says it's finished and then the operating system then reclaims that memory area. Storage devices are addressed as large one-dimensional arrays of logical blocks where the logical block is the smallest unit of transfer. Each logical block maps to a physical sector or semiconductor page. All this is starting to sound a little familiar, doesn't it? Pages, sectors, frames. If we're talking about a solid state drive, the one dimensional array of logical blocks is mapped onto the sectors of the device. Sector zero could be the first sector of the first track on the outermost cylinder of a hard disk drive, for example. Let's look at that graphic of a hard drive again. Here you see a track as that has been divided into those individual sectors. Now that is the smallest unit of measurement on this device. The mapping proceeds in order through the track, through the rest of the tracks on that cylinder, then through all the cylinders on the disk from outermost to innermost. For non-volatile memory, the mapping is from a finite ordered list of chip, block, and page to an array of logical blocks. A logical block address is easier for algorithms to use than a sector, cylinder, head tuple, or chip, block, page tuple. By using this mapping on a hard disk drive, we can at least in theory convert a logical block number into an old style disk access that consists of cylinder number, track number within that cylinder, and a sector number within the track.
There are more types of storage devices that are reasonable to cover in an operating system course. These devices have different characteristics from the more common devices and might need different caching and scheduling algorithms to maximize performance. So I think this is a good place for us to stop. So why don't you take a few minutes, review your notes, update your study guide, and when you're ready, come on back to lesson three.